What we're going to be talking today about is uh, software and databases for NMR-based metabolomics. Uh, this is part of our schedule where uh, it's now number three in our lecture. Um, and then later we'll talk about uh, spectral deconvolution methods and we'll wrap up for today on statistical NMR spectroscopy. So again, this is a picture we've already seen before. Um, but there's various software tools that allow you to go through either the deconvolution process, which I showed on one side, and um, the statistical methods that I showed on the other. And, and we're going to talk about some of the tools. We'll also talk about some of the databases, and those are all part of the software uh, system that you actually have to do for, for NMR-based metabolomics. Uh, and this will be an introduction. We'll, we'll dive into details a little bit later on. So typically, you need software to handle NMR data. So you have to do the processing, you have to do the visualization and the display, and peak picking and whatever else you need. So that's typically something that's part of almost every NMR instrument uh, or system. Some of them are independent of, of the NMR system. Then if you're doing some of the, the spectral uh, comparisons that we talked about, um, the analysis, the deconvolution, the binning, um, the Stocksy and Classy statistical NMR, you need software for that as well. And depending on where you are, whether you're doing targeted or untargeted metabolomics, uh, you'll also need stat data or software for doing multivariate statistics. That's something that we'll talk about uh, more on Friday uh, or in the last um, uh, four lectures of this, of this series. Uh, I'll talk a briefly a little bit about it in this, just as, as a, an introduction. Now, software is only so good if it, especially in the field of, of omics, you often need databases to really make the software useful. So in the case of spectral deconvolution, you need databases to do spectral identification. And you often need databases to help with the data interpretation and analysis. And I'll talk about some of those databases, at least for the interpretation and analysis later on. I'll talk about some of the software or databases used in spectral identification in this lecture. Now, what I'm presenting here is somewhat based on uh, material that was described in a review um, by a fellow named James Ellinger, who's with John Markley. Uh, it's published in a rather obscure journal um, called Current Metabolomics. It was the first volume. Volume first issue, page one, I think. Um, so uh, it is available uh, through PubMed uh, and the PMC uh, PubMed collection. Now, it's a little bit out of date. It's, you know, two or three years out of date. But it lists a number of, of key software uh, tools that are available for NMR uh, spectroscopy. So some of them are commercial uh, for things like doing spectral analysis. Others are things like um, tools for doing spectral mi mixture deconvolution. Uh, others are um, based for 1D, others for 2D. Um, and this covers a pretty complete list. As I say, a few of these are not, uh, or some aren't so frequently used, and there's a couple others that have appeared um, since this was first produced. Uh, the links are there, um, and, and most seem to be still active. They also went through a fairly detailed uh, assessment of the different types of um, features, uh, some with uh, the statistical approach, that's the chemometric approach that I talked about, uh, Metabolab, um, the AMIC software, um, there's also a couple of other tools that are um, still, well, need to be described. And they identify whether they are able to handle 1D or 2D, whether they're able to do binning or grouping, whether they support the multivariate statistics, um, and whether they can support pathway analysis. Um, and then the deconvolution ones, we've talked about um, um, the Konomics NMR suite, um, Metabo Minor, Colmar, there's others that have appeared since then and whether they're able to handle 1D or 2D. Um, so we'll dive into at least the, the commercial software that's used for data processing uh, and analysis. So these are very often bundled with the instrument um, that you purchase. So with Brooker, it's Topspin and Amex. With Varian and Agilent, it's called VNMRJ. 
Uh, we've mentioned Konomics, which is called the NMR suite, and then Mesterlab, which produces MNOVA, also has software for doing more and more metabolomic uh, analyses. ACD Labs is another one that produces um, a variety of NMR packages. So briefly, we'll look at a couple of these uh, in terms of top spin. It supports both things like pulse programming and pulse, pulse sequence design, but also allows you to do all the data acquisition and processing. It also supports small molecule structure elucidation and, and also has tools for chemical shift prediction and simulation. AMIC software is used for mixture analysis, and it can be used for both 1D and 2D. And uh, it has a variety of spectral databases, quite extensive. And it also supports the statistics, that multivariate statistics that we talk about, which is uh, partial or PCA rather than PCS and PLSDA and covariance analysis. Uh, the Konomics NMR suite. Um, so this does, uh, it's vendor independent NMR data processing. So it'll handle Varian and, and Brooker and maybe even JL and others. It's specific to 1D. Uh, and the spectral databases are 1D only. Uh, but it does a very comprehensive mixture analysis uh, and allows one to do both chemical identification and quantification. It's now got a semi-automated process, uh, which has made things quite a bit faster, and it also supports multivariate statistics as well um, with principal component analysis and PLSDA. Uh, MNOVA, which is produced by Mesterlab, uh, also has vendor-independent NMR data processing. So that's Brooker and Varian slash Agilent. It'll do one-dimensional, two-dimensional. It does have spectral databases. You can do spectral stacking, and it's ideal for publishing your spe spectra. It can do some partial mixture analysis. It's, it's not quite at the same caliber as, say, the Konomics software. Um, you can do peak picking and deconvolution. It does some statistics, not as extensive as AMIX or... Uh, economics. And it does have tools for chemical shift prediction and spectral simulation, similar to top spin. So those are, you know, three packages. Uh, some are vendor associated, some are independent, uh, but they're, they're certainly used by a number of groups. Um, and many, many groups will have all three. Um, others may just choose two of the three. Now, there's also some freeware uh, that you can get that will also do NMR data processing and analysis. Um, generally not as extensive, in many cases not quite as good as the, the commercial stuff, but if it's free, uh, well, that's, that's a pretty good price. Um, so there's a couple of tools I'll, I'll talk about. MVA Pack, um, which is produced by Bob Powers in Nebraska. RNMR, uh, which is produced by Ian Lewis to John Markley. Ian is based at the University of Calgary. Metabo Miner, uh, developed in our lab at the University of Alberta. Colmar NMR, developed at um, uh, the Ohio State University. And then also Basil, uh, which some of you have already heard about, and I'll talk about a little bit more in detail. So the MVA PAC uh, model, as I said, developed by uh, Powers, and the website where you can get it is, is there. A paper has been written about it. It's, it's written uh, in a programming language called GNU, uh, which is open access, called Octave. And it, it runs or behaves like MATLAB. So if you've ever worked in MATLAB or coded in MATLAB, or uh, it, it's apparently very similar to that. Um, as you can see, it, it allows you to take FIDs, to, to do the zero filling, Fourier transforming, phasing, and referencing, just like you would with any other standard spectral um, analysis tool. But then it could go from binning into principal component analysis, and it'll also do multi-sequence alignment to do PLSDA or OPLSDA. So with those, with the spectral binning, spectral loading, multivariate statistics, it's very much geared to the classical statistical spectroscopy. So it's not for compound identification. It's, it's statistical spectroscopy, which is uh, what's depicted here, which is showing those neat colored uh, NMR spectra. So in that regard, it, it's, it's cool, but I think it's a little dated in the sense that, that most people are now moving beyond the statistical spectroscopy. RNMR uh, is named RNMR because it's written in R. Um, works on many platforms, Windows, Mac OS, and Linux. Again, it's a downloadable pr program, just like MVA Pack. It does vendor-independent NMR data processing, just like MVA Pack. It's, it's really designed more for 2D NMR, uh, and in many respects, it was almost developed, uh, I think, uh, with um, 
protein NMR in mind, and then as an afterthought, um, metabolomics. Um, it has a capacity to do analysis of regions of interest, and that addition actually makes it useful for doing metabolomics, especially with 2D spectra. It's linked to a number of databases, in particular the, the, the Biomag ResBank database, which has lots and lots of spectra. So uh, Ellinger, who comes from the Markey lab, um, wrote quite extensively about the RNMR um, flow diagrams and workflow. And as I said, it, it, it supports or handles a lot of the things that you would expect of a, um, a general multidimensional NMR uh, package like XEasy or whatever. Um, but the, the fact that it allows you to do the regions of interest selection and spectral bins allows you to do metabolomic analysis and, and to get into the multivariate work. Um, it's not easy to use uh, or particularly easy to learn, but it is getting a, a, a substantial rewrite, I think, is in, in the works and, and it should make it much, much easier to work with. Uh, Metabominer is something that we worked on a number of years ago. It um, is designed for two-dimensional NMR. Um, it's written for Java or in Java and it works on, on most Windows systems. And at the time it was the first system to deal with or try and handle uh, two-dimensional spectroscopy. So this is, it has a lot of TOXI and HSQC spectra and a bunch of specialized sub-libraries for different biofluids. Um, it has some processing capabilities and it automates a lot of the compound ID and it allows you to annotate spectra directly and it's linked to things like the um, HMDB so you can connect to uh, compounds and their, and their characteristic spectra. Uh, we did a fair bit of testing and, and these were looking at both real um, mixtures, plasma, uh, as well as cocktails that were defined and at different pHs. And um, we assessed its overall performance and, and generally got um, you know, recall and precision or sensitivity and specificity in, in around 80 to 85 percent. So it wasn't perfect. And in fact, it's still, in many cases, the 2D NMR um, methods are, are uh, confounded by noise, typically. Um, and uh, if you have too much in terms of uh, spectral noise in the 2D spectrum or too much in terms of uh, features fr arising from, from coupling patterns, it, it, it gets confused. It's also a case that um, the types of spectra will vary uh, depending on the compounds and depending on the pulse sequences, what, what resonances are going to be visible. So picking up from that, uh, Raphael Bruchweiler um, realized that you could improve the quality of the 2D spectra somewhat um, and went painstakingly through all of the 2D spectra that had been released by the HMDB and BMRB and identified some of um, the issues. Uh, so now they have a much larger database. The Colmar database is about 700 compounds um, and it's both proton cozy, carbon cozy, and C13 HSQC spectra. Um, it doesn't do any data processing. It's a web server. So unlike RNMR, um, Tableau Analyst, a Amex, others, it, it, it's just basically take peak lists. So if you've done your work and you've got a good peak list, um, then you can actually get pretty good compound identifications. Um, but for the type of spectra that it's expecting, generally you will have had to collect for um, quite a few hours. So this is not high throughput. Um, so an example is a, an HSQC spectrum uh, from a Drosophila metabolite extract. You type in all of the peaks that you've peak picked and identified. Um, it will look through and then produce a, a, a list of returned results. So this is going from spectra to metabolites. Now it's not giving you concentrations, and I think uh, on my last comment, uh, and that's the same with even Metabo uh, Minor um, and, and some of the others, Concentrations are everything in metabolomics. So identification is important, and obviously if you're misidentifying things, then it'll mean your concentrations are incorrect. But identification is only the first step, and so what you really need to go for is, is, is identification and quantification. 
So Colmar, Metabol Analyst, RNMR, a lot of those programs appeared in 2007, 2008, 2009. Subsequently, uh, the community sort of took a, a step back and said, well, what we really need is something that A, doesn't focus on 2D, because that's too slow, it focuses on 1D, because that's what 99% of the population is measuring things, and it needs to be quantitative, and it needs to be automatic. So one of the first things to appear was a program called Batman. I've mentioned this a few times. So this is written in R, and it uses automated deconvolution, or supports automated deconvolution using Bayesian methods. So this means that it's, there's a dependency. If it suggests or thinks one thing is this compound, then it's going to affect the probability that the next signal is the other compound, which affects the probability of the next one. So this probability dependence is a function or characterized by Bayesian statistics. Now the limitation for Batman is that it still requires manual phasing, manual baseline correction, manual referencing. So that means that there's 30 people in this room. If each of you were to analyze a spectrum by Batman, you would end up with 30 different answers because every one of you is going to phase or baseline correct or reference differently. And, and so that's a problem. You want consistency. The other thing is that, that Bayesian statistics and R are not the fastest or most efficient things. So... When it's been tested on samples of 25 or 30 compounds, it takes up to eight hours. A human doing manual fitting can do it in about 30 minutes. So there isn't a whole lot of time saving to have a computer program taking that much time. And as a rule, as the, com as the mixture gets more and more complicated, it, it, it chokes. So it was a good effort, but it, it's, it's, it wasn't quite there. Um, as I said, we've been working on another approach uh, which uses not Bayesian statistics, even though it's called Bayesian, but it uses hidden Markov models. And hidden Markov models are used for speech recognition. And if you frame the problem uh, of peak fitting, uh, especially complex peak fitting, as, as a hidden Markov model uh, problem, it actually becomes something that can be solved a lot faster. Uh, in fact, it's very similar to our, the way our brains process signals and the fact that humans uh, can process NMR spectra if they're trained in, in a pretty good rate with pretty high accuracy. So all you're trying to do is do what a human does, but just do it a little faster and at a state that it doesn't get tired. So we've done a lot of testing with this one. Uh, it's a web server as opposed to a program. Um, but it's quite accurate, and it's very fast, about two minutes as opposed to, so eight hours with Batman. Um, the other thing that it does is that it automates the phasing, the referencing, the water removal, and the baseline correction. So that means that if 30 of you took an NMR spectrum and you ran it through Bayesian, you'd all get the same answer. It's not dependent on how you process your spectra. Now, in order for something to work like this, uh, you have to be able to tell it what type of biofluid it's working with. So if you're working with plasma, but then you say it's cerebral spinal fluid, it'll do a terrible job. Just like if you tell a speech recognition program that you're speaking English, but you're actually speaking Mandarin, it'll do a terrible job. So it needs prior knowledge or reasonable knowledge of what you're working with. It's also not... Uh, perfect. It's a 95% consistency, and it's limited to the types of um, three or four different types of biofluids into certain spectral frequencies from 500 to 600 to 700 megahertz. So it won't work at 900. It won't work with fecal water or won't work with plant extracts. Um, but it is something that uh, is being added to over time. So these are the tools. I've given you a sampling of the different tools that allow you to go from spectral data analysis to, to generating those spectral, spectral lists. Now, when you do the conversion of spectral lists, a spectra to spectral lists or metabolite lists, key to all of them is the availability of these uh, databases. Spectral deconvolution, spectral recognition, whether it's through Amex, Canomics, Basil, Batman, they all need spectral libraries. And what you need is that those spectra have to be collected under the same or near identical conditions to what your metabolomic experiments were done. 
So if you're collecting standard 1D spectra for pure metabolites and you have a uh, acquisition delays of 20 seconds and using different pulse sequences and then use a totally different acquisition delay or acquisition time and a totally different um, pulse width um, for your um, metabolite mixture, then it's not going to work. So you have to have consistent acquisition times. You also want to make sure that things are working on somewhat the same solvent, so don't collect something in DMSO and expect it to work it in water. You want things in the near same or similar pH, similar salt concentration. So all of those things have to be reasonable or normalized, and, and a fair bit of thought has to go into that sort of thing. But the same thing is true in gas chromatography and mass spec. Same thing is true in LCMS. Same thing is true with just about any analytical procedure where people standardize the approach. So NMR lags in that regard in, in trying to get standardization. So there's several databases. Uh, the Kinomics NMR suite has lots of spectra, uh, more than 500 now, ranging from 400 megahertz to 1.2 gigahertz for about a dozen different pH values. It's only for 1D. Amix has hundreds of NMR spectra, both for 1D and 2D and at multiple spectrometer frequencies, so it's a very large resource. Basil uh, is a very small database. It has about 60 spectra, just for 500, 600, and 700 megahertz. Colmar database has 700 compounds and spectra, Toxie HSQ collected at 500 and or 600 megahertz uh, for those 700 compounds. So those are examples of reference dBs that, that are used in, in spectral mixture deconvolution, um, and they vary in, in size and, and, and obviously in quality. There are other kinds of general databases that I've shown you guys this picture before, um, NMR Shift DB, BMRB, another database called the Spectral Database of Japan, which is produced by the Japanese uh, Standards Institute, AIST. Um, this has also a large collection of, of, of NMR spectra. It also contains, contains a large collection of mass spectra, FTIR spectra, uh, proton and carbon NMR uh, for thousands and thousands of compounds. It supports a large variety of spectral search tools. So it's a resource. Uh, it's not ideal. Uh, most of the compounds in this database are not metabolites, and that's important to remember. But some are, and sometimes that can be quite useful. So it's free, it's open access, although there are limits in terms of the number of downloads. I've talked about the Biomag Resbank. Those of you who've worked in protein NMR or dabbled in it would be aware of this database. It's been around for 10, 15 years. But as I say, it also supports a large number of um, reference metabolites. Um, right now it's almost 900 compounds. Um, that are supported or in Biomag Resbank. And they collected up to six different types of NMR spectra per compound. Some are pure protons, some are pure carbon, also 1D and 2D spectra. Searchable by a variety of na names from synonyms, inchi, formula, smiles. The initial focus for the Biomag Resbank was in Arabidopsis. So it's, it's more plant focused, but there are other mammalian metabolites in it. And they've done a great job with assigning things. Um, so they've, they've assigned just about every, every compound and every peak. NMR Shift DB, originally developed by uh, Chris Steinbeck, who is now uh, in charge of Metabolites, the database at the EBI. Uh, he handed this off to, I think, a, a collaborator, maybe former student. Um, and this has a lot of NMR spectra, um, 50,000 for more than 40,000 compounds. Uh, it's open access, open deposition. Uh, again, most of the spectra are not of metabolites. These are organic synthetic molecules that people have produced. But there are some metabolites, uh, some exotic molecules, and some natural products. So um, another unique feature of NMR ShiftDB is the fact that it supports chemical shift prediction. This is a web server that allows you to predict chemical shifts, draw a structure, get the predicted shifts for free. Um, you can search through the database by name or by structure or by chemical shift lists. Um, and it has a variety of chemical shift assignments. 
Now these are almost all inorganic solvents. So remember, most things that you do in metabolomics are in water. So the assignments are going to be different. And so this point that I've made about you really can't do assignments or comparisons unless you've got things that are mostly similar. But this at least can give you a hint uh, of what might be there if you're thinking or trying to find a novel compound. MMCD, which stands for the Madison Metabolomics Consortium Database, is essentially a merger or an extension of the Biomag ResBank. So it has, you know, 800-some spectra, 1D, 2D, uh, but it also included a large number of spectra that collected from the literature. So they went and hunted around and dug out the spectral assignments for a number of compounds, and they also added MS data for a number of compounds. So in that regard, it's uh, an extension of the Biomag ResBank. So you can do structure and spectral spectral searches, and has lots of other information about the chemicals that are described, um, the names and synonyms, structures, chemical physical properties, uh, and links to images and references. I've also mentioned the Human Metabolome Database. Um, this one was actually the first one to release uh, public uh, spectral data, uh, NMR data. Right now, HMDB has about 42,000 compounds um, corresponding to metabolites that are, that are known or by dint of biochemistry are expected to be in the human metabolome. It's, it's not just a database. It's actually an encyclopedia. Typically, each metabolite has hundreds of data fields. There are about 1,300, almost 1,400 compounds within MR spectra and about 900 with uh, HSQC spectra. Um, most, if not all, uh, of the spectra are assigned. Uh, they're available or viewable by images um, uh, and, and assignment lists. Uh, they're all collected in water. Some were collected in a mix of DMSO and water for very, very uh, hydrophobic molecules, probably molecules you'll never see um, in, uh, in a metabolomic study by NMR. Um, so there's static images. There's also a, a new interactive viewer, um, which allows you to click on things and zoom in and zoom out uh, interactively. And it's, it's all web-based using JavaScript. Um, this is an example of, of uh, an NMR ML type entry. Um, and we're in the process of updating all of the entries so that they will have full sets of NMR and NML assignments. So you'll see the structures. You'll see the the atoms and their assignments, and they'll display interactively on, on the screen, and chemical shifts and peaks and multiplet structures will be indicated. So that process is underway, and it'll probably be finished in a couple months. You can search uh, in HMDB. Um, you can type in a whole list of chemical shifts, or if you've isolated the compound, you can type in a, a partial list of, or list of assignments. It also accepts mixture spectra, um, so if you just write down all your peak assignments from your 1D spectrum, it'll, it'll do an, an attempt to identify uh, those peaks. It won't be good, but it'll at least give you a possibility of what, which ones match, and it'll give an indication of how, f how frequently those peaks match. So as I say, you can take a, a, an NMR spectrum of a mixture, type in the peak lists, and it'll list the high-scoring matches. Now, when you're working with databases, I've given you examples of some that are sort of generic compound spectral databases like SDBS or uh, NMR shift DB, and then I've given you some examples of more um, metabolite-specific databases like HMDB uh, or MMDB or, or uh, the Biomag ResBank. This is something that is often lost on people doing metabolomics, or at least when they first enter it. Most of you, if you do metabolomics, are going to be looking at a single organism. You're not going to say, oh, I'll study a rapidopsis and throw in some human samples and a couple cow samples and just do a metabolomics study. You're choosing a single organism. And when that's done, you have to remember that um, you want to look up information relevant to that organism. So studying humans and then trying to look, match, look for matches for Arabidopsis is not a good idea, uh, and vice versa. So 
if you try this, where you're trying to match things that can't be or are definitely not in a given organism, you're going to be in trouble. And this is still done very widely in the metabolomics community. It's, uh, the greatest offenders are the mass spectroscopists, but it's also a problem for NMR. So many people will, in the case of mass spectrometry, um, get a, a nice molecular formula from a very high-resolution mass spectrum. Um, they'll type in C6H12O6, and they'll get an answer. Uh, they'll probably get an answer about 100 different sugars, and they might choose the very first one. But if you come up with something like you know C17H28O5 N12, um, again you might get some peculiar match, and that might turn out to be a compound that was synthesized by an organic chemist 20 years ago. That um, was never released, um, uh, never made it into the environment, never consumed. It was only in the lab, and it was just a, sort of as a mimic. That is a compound you will not find in an animal or a plant or anything. So what you really want to do is work with organism-specific databases. Work with databases where people said, these compounds are known to be in humans, these ones are known to be in yeast, these ones are known to be in cows, these ones are known to be in X or Y or Z. And if you can work with organism-specific databases, you're not going to make mistakes. You're not going to have these misidentifications. And, and too often that's happening in, in metabolomics. So you can always come up to a situation, you know, you've got a nice spectrum, you've isolated it, or you're seeing a pattern that's significant, but what if it just doesn't have any match to your database? So in that regard, um, there's a real interest in, in the concept of spectral prediction. Um, in mass spectrometry, that's happening. In NMR, it's also been around for a long time, going from an NMR spectrum or structure to a spectrum. And, and there are a number of tools, actually, that, that support this. Almost all of these are commercial. Um, so Topspin has a, a method uh, from Brooker. Uh, MNOVA has a, a good method. Um, Perch NMR, which was acquired by Brooker, also is very good. I guess that might be part of the top spin now, I presume. Uh, ACD, NMR predictor, is actually considered to be the most accurate one. And, and ChemDraw also produces tools for uh, spectral prediction. Now, I mentioned that NMR ShiftDB also supports that, and that's a free uh, web access uh, for spectral prediction. Almost all of the chemical shift prediction tools use uh, semi-empirical methods. And this means that they have to work with a large database of known chemical shift assignments. And the larger the database, the better the predictor. So ACD has the largest database. Very, very large. Um, so they use a thing called HOSE code prediction. So HOSE stands for Hierarchical Organization of Spherical Environments. And it's basically um, drawing progressively larger circles around uh, an atom of interest and um, assessing the similarity of that environment to other environments where the chemical shifts are known. And so the first layer, they just took a look at things that are one bond away. The second layer is typically every, all the atoms that are two bonds away. And the third layer, everything that's three or more bonds away. So in this way, you can identify substructures. Uh, some of them are obvious substructures, like you know, here's a carboxylate, here's a ketone. But others are just simply um, fragments. So in that regard, it's sort of fragment comparison. But as I say, once you can do the fragment comparison, you can say this looks very, very similar to another fragment, and it's also assigned. Um, therefore, I will assume the chemical shifts are very much like that. So when you do and use hose code prediction, um, you can do pretty, pretty good. Um, this is just a correlation between um, observed and predicted chemical shifts. And this was described uh, in a paper by Kuhn and, and Chris Steinbeck um, of Metabolites fame. Um, and they were working actually on a, a, a freeware tool for chemical shift prediction. But eventually they gave up because they realized uh, they couldn't, couldn't even come close to what uh, some of the commercial programs like ACD were doing. How good do commercial programs do? Um, this is an example of a really complicated um, natural product. And at the bottom um, is the simulated spectrum, and at the top is the observed spectrum. And you can see that the 
position of the chemical shifts, the general pattern, the general intensities are all actually very well predicted. It's not perfect, but if you compare this to a mass spectrum where someone tried to predict the mass spectrum of this, there's no comparison. This is, this is a very accurate prediction. And this is why NMR spectroscopy is the gold standard for structure determination and structure validation and novel compound characterization. So that's, those are the commercial tools. As I said, there are some uh, freeware packages. NMR ShiftDB, as I say, has uh, a web server. I believe, although it's hard to tell, it uses um, um, code that might be from a, a resource called nmrdb.org, but I can't, can't be certain. Anyways, they are empirical, and they may either use hose or neural networks. You can go a step further. Uh, quantum mechanical methods for predicting chemical shifts are getting very, very good. Uh, density functional theory, DFT, uh, with larger basis sets is incredibly robust to the point where they are predicting protein chemical shifts very accurately now. So small molecules are trivial uh, for these, these programs. They can predict the chemical shifts. If you want to predict the, the coupling patterns, strong and weak, you can use programs like Laocoon or Blocklib or Simpson. So they'll do the sim spin simulation. So it's possible uh, to get free stuff for doing chemical shift prediction, but it's, it's not generally widely available. So at least when it comes to um, NMR shift DB, um, this is an online one. It'll do both proton and carbon. You can sketch a structure. Um, and because it does try and use the assigned uh, compounds in its library, uh, obviously the larger the library, the better it'll get. Um, and as I say, I believe, although it's not clear, it uses the NMRDB uh, server. So the NMR, NRDB server uses a neural network that was developed by a group in Portugal. Some of that code, I think, is actually used by AmNova. So it's a very incestuous thing with everyone using the same code or borrowing um, and no one really acknowledging who's using what. And, but again, it is a, a tool where you can sketch a structure, submit, and it'll get the um, a proton or carbon chemical shifts predicted. So if you are dealing with an unknown and you're wanting to identify something uh, by NMR, um, you can do that. And you can use that, these tools that I've just talked about by spectral prediction. But it also means that you're starting to deal with that dark matter of the metabolome, or as we also call it, the unknown unknowns. And the term unknown unknowns uh, came out of Donald Rumsfeld, um, a quote that he had when he was trying to explain what they knew about um, Al-Qaeda and the Taliban. Um, but it's something that's been reused many, many times. Um, and for people trying to characterize unknowns, uh, we sometimes call it the unknown. So this is this issue where you know, only a small percentage of, of the peaks and features that we see <coughs> with very high sensitive instruments can be truly identified. And we'll call it the dark matter, the unknown unknowns, the unknown. And I gave you guys an estimate early on that it was somewhere between one and a half and two million compounds in the human unknown. And, and NMR will be the method that we will have to use um, to characterize these, these compounds. And let's assuming it's 2 million compounds, uh, that's a lot of work for a lot of people for a very, very long time. So that's another reason why NMR is, is pretty important here, and in fact why the idea of, of spectral prediction and compound characterization uh, via spectral prediction is very, very important. There is a field of computer... Um, or cheminformatics, I guess, uh, called computer-aided structure elucidation, or CASE, C-A-S-E. And this is involving typically taking a, a purified compound and collecting a couple of NMR types of spectra, so typically a uh, heteronuclear multiple bond uh, correlation, or HMBC spectrum, uh, an inadequate uh, spectrum, 1D spectrum as well, but also a high-resolution mass spectrum, which gives you the molecular formula. 
And the principle or the feeling was that if you could get a high resolution mass spec that gave you the molecular formula and you could collect two or three types of NMR spectra, you should be able to fully determine the structure of any compound. And it was shown by very skilled natural product chemists that that was sufficient. They could do this. And so the people in computing and artificial intelligence said, well, if they can do it, a computer can do it. So ACD Labs uh, put most of its resources for most of the last decade to develop a tool called Structure Elucidator. And because they knew they had the world's best chemical shift predictor, uh, and because they could simulate or model a variety of different types of spectra, and because they also had tools for doing spectral mass spectral analysis, they decided to put the whole thing together. So this is sort of a schematic diagram of how ACD, the structure elucidator, works. Uh, so it takes the molecular formula, takes the 1D and 2D NMR spectra, and then it generates a molecular conductivity diagram, or MCD. And then it generates a whole bunch of potential structures. And then from the potential structures, it will try and validate those based on the observed. And the best fit to the observed data will be the top ranks structure, and then there'll be a second and a third one. So they worked on it for a very long time, got some great um, staff. Uh, almost all of their programmers are in Russia. Uh, almost all their data was acquired by Russians. But uh, Tony Williams or Anthony Williams, who developed ChemSpider, led the team. And um, they published uh, a paper in 2010 where they actually demonstrated this system um, was able to um, beat humans um, in terms of its performance. It identified a number of compounds that uh, people had misidentified and subsequently the computer corrected them. Um, and then they've published some other examples where these are pretty complicated natural products that they've used just with this um, commercial product, the um, structure elucidator. So it's not just you know, simple amino acids. It's, it's um, very complicated polyaromatic molecules with all kinds of uh, components that can be determined unambiguously um, with this uh, tool. And these structures don't have to be in any database. These are completely novel structures. So I think to wrap up, uh, we've looked at a bunch of software tools um, that allow you to do a variety of things. Um, there's obviously software for spectral processing and visualization, which is typically coupled with, with most of the vendors. Um, uh, some are uh, vendor independent. Um, we've looked at other tools that are available for mixture analysis, the deconvolution. But some of it's automatic, some of it's manual. Um, some are downloadable programs, uh, some of them are web servers. We've also looked at some tools that allow you to do the chemometric analysis or statistical spectroscopy. MVA PAC is of note, but also Economics and Amex support that. Without databases, none of these software tools would work, so we've highlighted a number of key uh, metabolite databases, the Human Metabolome Database, the Biomag ResBank, MMCDB. These are in some cases, uh, organism-specific or metabolite-specific. There are other databases I've mentioned which don't really cover metabolites but may give you a hint if you're looking at some kind of novel compound. If you're looking at novel compounds, you have to use a different approach. You have to use spectral prediction, and this is where NMR is particularly good, particularly powerful. And there are a number of commercial packages as well as uh, a few freeware tools that do that. And then in terms of structure elucidation, um, the ACD structure elucidator is, is probably the best one out there. There are other tools that are starting to appear. Uh, I believe Brooker also has one. Uh, MNOVA, I think, is also offering one now as well. Um, but these open the door to doing novel compound characterization to characterize the uh, unknown, as we call it, or the dark matter of the metabolome.